deepest thanks to Imam Saeed al Kazwini, to Najah Pazi, to Esra Musawi, to everybody from the YMA, in fact, to all of you here for doing me the honor of inviting me to celebrate with you tonight. And uh, please tell me if I'm not speaking loud enough. Can everybody hear in the corners? Okay, good, thank you. Now, since I was born and educated in England, I'm gonna start, if you'll forgive me, with a bit of English understatement and say that I might be considered a somewhat unusual kind of speaker. In fact, there's a perfect Yiddish word for me right now here, and that is chutzpah. And chutzpah could be, depending on your inflection and on your context, anything from an almost admirable kind of nerve, but only almost, to a totally unforgivable degree of transgression. And as an agnostic Jew with a Catholic convent school education, talking about Islam to a Muslim audience, the truth is I'm not quite sure right now exactly where on the scale of chutzpah I stand. So um, forgive me if I talk about myself a little here. It's not out of any desire for self-promotion. Uh, but I think it's important to know who we are, who each other is, and thus to appreciate more deeply not only where we're coming from, but also where we meet. Now, to state the obvious, I'm not an insider. I'm an outsider looking in, which means that I come with a very different perspective. So I'm speaking here as a writer who's explored some of the early history of Christian Christianity, Judaism, and Islam in her last three books, and who's fascinated by this vast and volatile arena in which politics and religion intersect and jostle up against each other. I'm speaking as a psychologist, my original academic field, and as a historian, trying to figure out the dynamics both of what happened and what's happening now. And I'm speaking as an agnostic, that is, as someone with a deep sense of religious mystery, but no affinity for belief per se, which is the result perhaps of that childhood as the only Jew in a convent school, which means I'm very much, as I call the blog, an accidental theologist. Now, this is a perspective that has its advantages and that also has its disadvantages. Right now, for instance, as some of you know, I'm working on a new biography of the prophet. One I feel is urgently needed for non-Muslims because in all the biographies I've read, and the hundreds in English alone, I never get a real feel for who he was as a man. A feel for the man himself. I have done a lot of research. I do seem to know a lot about the prophet including, of course, the early Sirah and Hadith. But my trouble is, the more the details, the more he seems to be weighed down beneath them, hidden by the sheer mass of them. So what I've been trying to do is to get a real feel, first for the dramatic arc of his life, and then for the radical impact of his message, and then for the answer or actually an answer, or better still, some possible answers to the question of why this man at this time in this place? Why Muhammad in Mecca in the seventh century? I want to know, as it were, what it was to be Muhammad. Now, you'll hardly be surprised if I tell you that this has placed me in something of an existential dilemma. Just last month, at least until January 25th when Al Jazeera took over my life, this agnostic Jew was focused on trying to fathom in words the pivotal Gnostic moment of Islam. 
the night on Mount Hera, when the prophet received the first revelation. The night of power, the night of destiny, Laylat al qadr This is a central moment of history. You could call it the night that changed the world. So what happened that night? To a Muslim believer, the answer is simple. God spoke to Muhammad. Or we could change just one word and say God spoke through Muhammad. Either way, it's a historical moment of the deepest mystical significance. And as such, it's beyond explanation, beyond the, beyond the scope of words, and beyond human comprehension. And yet, if I'm to convey a real sense of who Muhammad was, to break through this Western screen of stereotypes and misunderstandings about him, it has to be addressed. So I've been trying to put into words what I know cannot be put into words. I've been trying to understand what I know is beyond human understanding. And even as I realize fully that this is an absurd thing to attempt, I persist. Because if I am to make Muhammad real for non-Muslim readers, I know I must make what he experienced real. Now, I'm sure some of you think that this is a clear case of fools rush in where angels fear to tread. But if so, I'd rather be a fool for trying than a different kind of fool for not trying. Because you could say that this is my profession and my vocation. It's to risk playing the fool. That is, it's to always be asking questions, always trying to understand from the inside even as I know how outside I am. That's what I did as a journalist in the Middle East. It's what I did as a psychologist. And it's what I do now as a writer. So I place my faith, as it were, in inquiry. My last book, After the Prophet, also began with a question. And as with so many good questions, it was a deceptively simple one. It was posed by a friend shortly after the 2004 Ashura massacre, massacre in Karbala. And he phrased it this way. How come Muhammad, the prophet of unity, of one people, one God, could leave behind him this seeming unending legacy of division? The question haunted me. And I began to read, going deeper and deeper, until I found the magisterial history of Al-Tabari, the Tarikh. And there I found the full details of this epic story, so powerful that I was stunned that it could have gone for so long, all but unknown in the West. And I knew I had to retell it in a way that could get through to non-Muslim readers. Why was it all but unknown? Well, first, Al-Tabari's Tarikh was only translated into English in the 1990s, in 39 volumes. But there's another factor, and it's related to the fact that it took 39 volumes to translate. And this other factor is that in this age of instant information, if my friend's question was posed at all, the answer usually came in a nutshell, a paragraph at best or just a couple of sentences, or even a dismissive kind of, oh, a dispute over the succession of Muhammad. I call this the nutshell syndrome. Think hazelnuts or pecans, glossy, smooth, perfectly shaped, but still just shells. No meat, no substance unless you crack them open. No indication of the depth and power of the story, the intensity of it, just a glossy superficiality. The shell is all you get. Now for a writer, this is a wonderful opportunity. I mean, it's such a story to be told. But it's also somewhat dismaying to have such an opportunity because it depends entirely on how little non-Muslims know about Islam. Just how little was made clear to me once again recently at a dinner party in Seattle given by a couple 
He a lawyer, she a designer. He Jewish, she Catholic, neither of them remotely observant. And they were asking me about the TEDx talk I gave on the Quran, and I, as I told them about it, the table went quiet. They were clearly astonished by the fact that the, a third of the Quran retells the stories of biblical figures like Abraham and Joseph, Mary and Jesus. It was all news to them. They turned off the background music, leaned in, listened intently. Now they and their guests were well-meaning, relatively well-read liberals, yet nobody there, there were no Muslims among them, nobody there had any awareness of the Quran as, as it itself says, a confirmation and renewal of the Torah and the Gospels. No awareness that what in the United States is generally called the Judeo-Christian tradition is, in fact, the Judeo-Christo-Islamic tradition. Then they should read the Quran, you might say, but as I tried to explain in that absurdly short talk, as you can imagine, nine hours would have been easier than nine minutes, reading the Quran is far easier said than done. So instead of actually being read, it's usually simply quoted. And I do mean simply. As with the flood of quotations from the Bible, the Quranic quotations tend to be highly selective and out of context. In other words, they're not really quotations at all. They're misquotations. And it's not only non-Muslims who do this. What particularly interests me is that the people who use the Quran this way are both Muslim and non-Muslim. That is, conservative Islamists and conservative Islamophobes. Both groups use what I call the highlighter version of the Quran. Feeding each other the same outer context quotes, reinforcing each other's prejudices and extremism, to the extent that the highlighter version often includes phrases that simply aren't there. Phrases that meet preconceived expectations but aren't there in reality. So fundamentalist Muslims and non-Muslim conservatives are basically partners in the stereotyping of Islam as violent and extremist. And many people have asked me what surprised me most when I spent those three months reading the Quran. And to tell the truth, I'm not quite sure why this particular question, everybody asks it, and I'm beginning to suspect it must be taught in Journalism 101 or something. But it, really, it wasn't a surprise, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But I think the answer has to be how flexible the Quran is, at least in minds that are not fundamentally inflexible. In fact, it's flexible even to the point of being reflexively flexible. It's from Surah 3. Some of these verses are definite in meaning, it says, and others are ambiguous. The perverse at heart will eagerly seek out the ambiguities, trying to create discord by pinning down meanings of their own. Only God knows the true meaning. Which is something to bear in mind the next time someone shouts with fundamentalist certainty, this is what it says. The phrase God is subtle, Allah la difun kabir, appears several times. And in fact, the whole of the Quran is far more subtle than non-Muslims have been led to believe. And this is an essential part of its power. It has the awareness that there are things that cannot be stated directly, that are beyond direct human apprehension, that can only be expressed through metaphor, which allows room for the mind to roam, to explore, to soar even. Room, that is, for the mind to leap between what is known and what cannot be known. And this is why extremist fundamentalism is not only dangerous, but dull. It dulls the mind with its insistence on the literal. It actually dumbs down the holy. <laughs>
all the great religious texts use metaphor, which is why I was not at all surprised by the Quran's flexibility. It's why they resonate in the mind, why they've grasped the human imagination for so many centuries. These are texts that resonate through our cultures, just as the Quran resonates through Muslim culture, so the Hebrew Bible resonates through Jewish culture, and the King James Bible through Christian culture. And if we leave no room for them to reverberate, if we insist on the most literal readings, then we kill that capacity to grasp the imagination, to go beyond the shell to the soul. So if you have no feeling for metaphor, then fundamentalism is for you. If you're threatened by paradox, then fundamentalism is for you. If uncertainty drives you crazy, then fundamentalism is for you. But then, as I see it, you will not be religious. You will, in fact, be fundamentally anti-religious because the essence of any religion surely lies not in dogma. That really is just the outer shell but in the experience of it. It lies not in the letter of the law, but in the spirit of it. As St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in one of his better moments, the letter kills, the spirit gives life. Now, I want to stress that what I'm gonna say next is itself hugely simplistic. But perhaps one could say that there are two major ways, two major paths of being religious. One of these is to expand the self in awe or the sense of self, to expand the sense of self in awe and wonder and gratitude and humility. The other is to close oneself in behind high walls of absolute certainty and righteousness a kind of demonstrative, overweening pride in being so very right. The former expands your sense of the world and of other people. The latter circumscribes it, using dogma to wall off the believers, whatever their faith, against the rest of the world. Now you could say that if someone wants to tie their mind into a straitjacket, that's their problem and their choice. But our problem is that since such a mind can't accept that others may think differently, it has no respect for the minds and souls of others, let alone their lives. It dehumanizes others. In its eagerness to be right, to be righteous, it devolves into zealotry. So the most dogmatic loudly proclaim themselves the only real Christians or Jews or Muslims and their counterparts, in the case of Islam, Islamophobes, do them the favor of believing that. And the result, of course, is a vicious circle. As Nick Kristof wrote last weekend in the New York Times, American paranoia about Islamist fundamentalism has done as much damage as Islamist fundamentalism itself. And this paranoia infects even the most well-intentioned who are often unaware of how it influences what they see. Think, for instance, of the scene shown in the American media from the first week of the uprising in Egypt. You had a close-up of 200 people bowed down in prayer, excluding the tens of thousands who stood behind them not praying. You had a protester holding a poster of Mubarak with horns and a Star of David drawn on his forehead. The only one of its kind, it turns out, in the whole of Tahrir Square, since this was not about Israel, it was about Egypt. Or a few days later, the replay after replay of Molotov cocktails, flames lead being the mantra, of course, of all TV news, reinforcing the image of rioting Muslims out of control, the infamous Arab street, exactly the image Mubarak was aiming for, of course. All these images were manipulated 
either consciously by the regime for political ends or unconsciously by the media as a result of preconceived ideas. This is how we show a Muslim country. Thus, the pumping up of the Muslim Brotherhood as a threat by both the Mubarak regime and conservative Western pundits, as though the Brotherhood had widespread support, which it doesn't. As though the Egyptian protesters were extraordinarily dumb and naive. As though they were not highly aware of how the Iran revolution of 1979 was hijacked and perverted as though they couldn't see the Wahhabi regime in Saudi Arabia right across the Red Sea from them, or the Hamas Salafis in Gaza who squelched solidarity rallies in support of the Egypt uprising and arrested those who tried. As though the only way to be Muslim was to be radically fundamentalist, misogynistic, and anti-Semitic. Thus, the surprise in the West at the sophistication of the Tahriris, the astonishment when the Arab street turned out to include doctors and lawyers and women and Google executives. Thus, the continually stated fear stoked by both the regime and Western conservatives that at any moment the protesters might shift from nonviolence to violence, that the nonviolence was merely a cover for some assumed innate propensity to violence. Thus, the slowness to realize that the old anti West sloganism had been superseded, that this wasn't about resentment of the West. In fact, that it was about the very things President Obama talked about in his speech right there in Cairo just 20 months ago, about democracy and freedom and dignity. In short, what I heard and saw in those first few days was the modern version of Orientalism, the idea that the Orient, that is the Middle East, and it should come as no surprise here that the geography is as weird as the idea itself, is an inherently violent, primitive, medieval kind of place. Or as right-wing Israeli politicians have been endlessly repeating for decades, quote, a bad neighborhood. And that the responsibility of self-styled, enlightened Westerners and despotic leaders alike was to keep these benighted people under control. But then as the uprising went on into the second week, something began to change. Most non-Muslims I know reacted to the events in Egypt at first with surprise, if in fact they reacted at all. Nobody at the blog of Seattle's alternative paper, The Stranger, for example, I live in Seattle, and The Stranger, one would have thought, would have been the first to support any kind of uprising, even bothered to comment on it at first. When they finally began to, it was with their usual stance of world-weary, pseudo-sophisticated cynicism, a mask, of course, for sheer provincialism. But... When Mubarak unleashed his goons and the protesters responded by coming back the next day in still greater numbers, even the stranger gave way to open excitement and admiration. And how not? What we saw was courage. The most stunning kind of courage, real courage. The kind of courage that brought tears to our eyes as we were glued to the Al Jazeera live stream and the Twitter feeds in our computers. What we saw was thousands and then town tens of thousands and then millions of people standing up to repression and dictatorship and corruption and injustice, defying all odds in the full knowledge of what awaited them if they failed. Prison, torture, and death. What we saw, that is, live, in real time, in our time, in the city of the Al Hussein Mosque, seemed to me a modern manifestation of the spirit of Karbala. <laughs> 
the irrepressible striving for freedom and for justice and for dignity. Now, pause for water. Obviously, what's been achieved in Egypt and in Tunisia, and perhaps also now in Bahrain, and who knows, maybe Libya, Yemen, and more, is immense. There's been much punditry about what it means for America, America being as self-centered as any other country. And there'll certainly be a, a ton more such punditry, but I think its biggest, biggest effect here in the States is yet to register, and that is psychological. Because these revolutions, achieved through determinedly nonviolent action, constitute a radical, positive challenge to the politically manipulated atmosphere of fear and paranoia about Islam. In fact, as another New York Times columnist, Roger Cohen, wrote a few days ago, 2-11, February 11, may be the perfect antidote to 9-11. I may be being overly optimistic here, but I seriously think there is a very good chance that these events will help create a major paradigm shift here in the United States, one that seemed unimaginable just a few weeks ago, and one even a congressman like Peter King might have to take into account. <laughs> Though many people don't yet realize it, I suspect that a lot of the Orientalist assumptions about Islam, about Muslims, and about Arabs in particular, have been tossed out along with Ben Ali and Mubarak. The Tahriris challenged not just the regime, but also the crude stereotypes of Arab equals riots in the street, of Islam equals violence and terrorism, and above all, with the ongoing flood of images of Egyptians peacefully demanding democracy, of Islam as somehow fundamentally anti-democratic. What I saw here in America as the protests went into the third week was more and more people the kind of people who until recently couldn't even have found Egypt on a map, expressing open admiration and support for the protesters. And I listened as they talked about the Muslim women and the Muslim doctors and the Muslim Google executives in Tahrir Square, and it's as though they were saying, almost in so many words, my God, they don't hate our freedom. They don't hate our way of life. For Christ's sake, they're risking their lives in order to have that freedom and that way of life. What I saw, in short, was respect. Well, hallelujah. Perhaps more Muslims will now be able to listen, more non-Muslims will now be able to listen to what most Muslims really think and believe to realize that the vast majority of Muslims worldwide not only condemn Islamist terrorism, but see it for what it is, not just a distortion of the faith, but a travesty of it. Now, I hardly need to tell you that the most highly respected Islamic leaders, Imam Sayyid Kazwini in the forefront, have condemned terrorism repeatedly. The Fika Council Fatwa of 2005 which Imam Kazwini helped write, stated that Islam strictly condemns religious terrorism and the use of violence against innocent lives. Targeting civilian life through suicide bombing or any other form of attack is haram, and those who commit such barbaric acts are criminals, not martyrs. But despite the ongoing conservative cause of where are the Islamic leaders condemning terrorism, such condemnations have so far gone largely unreported in the national media and thus unheard. Take last year's extraordinarily detailed 600-page fatwa on terrorism and suicide bombing by Pakistani Sheikh Tahir al Kurri, for instance. Now, it's true that writing 600 pages is not exactly the way to catch the flighty attention of the American media, of whom a five-second soundbite does far better, but still, 
There was barely a mention in the American press. And this, I think, will now change. For instance, I think there will, may well be a far larger crowd than seemed possible a few weeks ago at the rally just called by Imam Faisal Razul to be held in New York City on March 6th under the banner of Today I am a Muslim too. Called for March 6th because on March 7th Congressman Peter King begins his hearings on the supposed radicalization of, Islam, of American Muslims. The change won't be as rapid as the Egypt Revolution, of course. What could be? It'll take time. But despite the Peter Kings of the world, I'm now hopeful that it won't take the generation or two I thought until recently that it would take. Not that it will be painless. Stereotypes persist because they're easy. They persist because people who believe them don't have to think and don't want to think. Reconsidering them requires thought and thought is hard. It means opening up your mind and to the closed-minded, nothing is more painful or more threatening. In turn, there's probably nothing harder for the open-minded to deal with than this closed-mindedness. Closed-mindedness, you see, is infectious. Trying to deal with it, we risk becoming closed-minded in our own way. As Tariq Ramadan said recently, it is very, very difficult to be open-minded with people who don't have the same mind as yours. Thus the anger when the stench of stereotype becomes overpowering. For instance, when I read Ayan Hirsi Ali talking about the Muslim mentality, and that's a quote, all I have to do is substitute one word to get exactly where she's coming from. Just as anyone who can use a phrase such as the Jewish mentality is clearly anti-Semitic. So anyone who uses a phrase like the Muslim mentality, no matter how pretty, or soft-spoken, or how compelling her backstory is just as clearly Islamophobic. Only a bigot could generalize in such a way about millions of Jews or nearly one and a half billion Muslims. But it isn't only people who've been stereotyped here. It's religion itself, seen solely in terms of belief, with no concept of tradition, of identity, of culture, of a way of being in and of the world. Let me explain a little bit by saying that though I'm agnostic, on the anniversary of my parents' deaths, I light a memorial can a candle and I recite the Kaddish, the prayer for the dead. And I do this as a matter of practice, not of belief. I do it because it feels right. It's a matter of tradition and of loyalty, a means of honoring my parents in a way that I know they would be glad to be honored. It's an act that both comforts me and binds me, binds me to my history, my identity, my sense of myself. But you know, Hardly any American Jews I know who consider themselves far more religious than I am can recite the Kaddish prayer without an English transliteration, and even then they can't do it very well. And while the Christians I know go to church every Sunday, what most of them actually know about the history of their own religion is dismayingly little. So here's the thing that's so easy to forget. We talk about ignorance of Islam, but non-Muslims are often, and in fact, usually, just as ignorant about their own faiths. And often, they distort their own faiths as badly as they distort Islam. Sometimes I'm even tempted to think that most evangelical Christians only ever read one book of the Bible, and that's the last one, Revelation, with its apocalyptic nightmares. Just as you could imagine that most Islamist extremists seem to know only one surah of the Quran, repentance, with the sword verses, so-called. An Orientalist misnomer, of course, right there, since the word sword never appears. 
and they have no idea of the historical circumstances of this surah, of its context, its frame of reference. Whoops. And so we come back to the highlighter version. Let's look, for instance, at this verse. When God delivers the city into your hands, you shall smite every male with the edge of your sword. You shall save alive nothing that breathes, but shall surely destroy them all. I haven't got it wrong. If this doesn't sound too familiar, that's because it is, in fact, one of the many peace-loving passages from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 20, which continues to drive home the point, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall surely destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. That's a lot of people. And this isn't the only kill them all order in the Bible. There's plenty more in Judges and Samuel just for a start. Look up the word destroy in a biblical concordance and you'll find one of the longest lists it offers. The entry for peace is barely a quarter as long. On the other hand, we have these passages, all of which sound very familiar to Christians even if they can't quite place them. Do not let hatred lead you away from justice. If anyone kills a person, it is as if they have killed all humanity. If they save a life, it is as if, as if they have saved the lives of all humanity. An eye for an eye was formerly prescribed, but if anyone forgives out of mercy and charity, this will serve as atonement for their own bad deeds. Of course, none of these are from the Gospels, though they certainly sound to Christians as though they should be, but from the Quran. So that infamous section in the ninth surah about killing the unbelievers, it does indeed say that, but in a very specific context, the anticipated conquest of Mecca, where fighting was usually forbidden. Just eight years after the Hijra, the Muslims of Medina were ready to take Mecca and Muhammad's followers had asked him for guidance as to what to do if they came under attack near the Kaaba. Could they fight back and in that case even kill someone on holy ground? The response in the form of a, rev of a revelation was that yes, this was permitted, but the permission to use violence comes hedged about with qualifiers. Not you, not you must kill unbelievers in Mecca, but you can, you are allowed to, but only after a grace period is over. And only if there is no other pact in place by then. And only if they try to keep you away from the Kaaba. And only if they attack you first, and even then. God is merciful, Forgiveness is supreme, and so, essentially, better if you don't. Now, I'm fascinated by this approach of better if you don't, which appears several times in the Quran. What we have here, as I understand it, is a gradualist approach to the radical social changes included in the Prophet's message. It's a recognition that if change is really to take root, it can't be dictated and imposed on people from above, but that they need to be invited into it. So basically, instead of an order, it's an invitation, an invitation to a better way of doing things, an appeal to the better side of human nature. Yes, if you insist, you may continue in the old ways, but really, think about it, consider carefully, and you'll see, better if you don't. It's a recognition that it takes time for mere humans to adjust to a new way of seeing and being in the world. The same might also be said of a new way of both seeing Islam and being Muslim in America. Again, this won't happen overnight, but I think it has begun, and not only because of Egypt and Tunisia. <clears throat> 
the roots of it already in place with a new generation of American Muslims in their 20s and 30s. Some are religious, some are not, but still identify as Muslim in much the same way that I still identify as Jewish. Some are third, fourth, or even fifth generation Americans. Some are sons and daughters of immigrants. Some are converts. But they have one major thing in common. They're beginning to make Islam cool. Because they're cool. They include writers and filmmakers, IT innovators and political activists, comedians and academics, and yes, there, there are such things as cool academics, all of them wearing their Muslim identity or their hyphenated one, Muslim American, Muslim Pakistani American, Lebanese American Muslim and so on, with a kind of casual confidence. They're involved. They're activists, and they're not in the least defensive. Armed with a wry humor and a sharp sense of irony, they laugh at simplistic slogans like Islam versus the West. An absurd juxtaposition, of course, given that so many Westerners are Muslim. Or at the infamous meme of the clash of civilizations since what they represent is the blending of civilizations. In short, they're the increasingly visible polar opposite of Islamist extremism. Without even trying, they confound the stereotypes. And the more visible they become, the less the smallest but most extreme minority can claim, as it inevitably does, to represent the whole. I know how infuriating the dominance of that loud minority can be. The loudest American Jews, for instance, are still those in knee-jerk support of every policy of the Israeli government. But younger liberal Jews are now realizing that their identity as Jews has nothing in common with that of Bible-spouting settlers who seem to think the Palestinians are disposable or with an Israeli government that's made Gaza into a huge internment camp. Just as you are appalled by terrorists acting in the name of their distortion of Islam, so I am appalled by terrorists acting in the name of their distortion of Judaism. I see those settlers as my Al-Qaeda, and their claim to represent the Jewish people not only insults me, but insults both the spirit and the essence of Judaism as I see it, while their claim to represent God is quite simply obscene. Judgment belongs to God alone, it says in the Quran. And it's a measure of just how obscenely a holy text can be distorted that the earliest Islamist extremists, the Harijis, the followers of Imam Ali who turned against him when he agreed to arbitration after the Battle of Sifin adopted that as their battle cry. The assassin who slashed at Ali with his knife shouted that very line as he did so. Judgment belongs to God alone. Without realizing it seems that so it does. To God and not to humans. So the terrible irony is that while the Harijis were so adamantly quoting the Quran, they were at the same time denying it by insisting that they had the right to judge for God. They acted, that is, as though they were God, playing both judge and executioner. In religious terms, I believe this is called heresy. In non-religious terms, it's certainly the most stunning arrogance, which is exactly what the Quran repeatedly warns against. So the real co-religionists here, as I see it, are the fundamentalist extremists, the Harijis of all faiths. Al-Qaeda suicide bombers killing pilgrims in Iraq, settlers in the West Bank shooting Palestinian farmers, American anti-abortionists killing doctors as they claim to defend life. All these are brothers in arms, quite literally blood brothers. 
fundamental, fundamentalist extremism, that is, is really a separate religion all its own, or rather an anti-religion, because it kills the essence of faith. It leaves just the shell, that shiny, glossy, impermeable shell of righteousness with nothing inside, or in fact, less than nothing, because it kills the soul. Now, as an agnostic, I'm always hesitant to say I know for sure, but this I do know for sure. Muhammad himself would be nothing but utterly repelled and dismayed, outraged by what has been and is still being said and done by terrorists and extremists in his name and in the name of God. The rigidity of mind and inhumanity of action displayed by both 7th and 21st century extremists are the exact opposite of the ethics of the Quran, which consistently returns to the admonition of forgiveness, to compassion, honor, and mercy as being the higher road. To endure with fortitude and to forgive is a duty incumbent on all, it says. Whoever bears patiently and is forgiving, surely that is constancy to God. Now, not long ago, I heard a wonderful definition of forgiveness, one that combines wisdom with humor, insight with humanity. Forgiveness, it went, is abandoning all hope of a perfect past. And it seems to me as a psychologist that a lot is contained in that word perfect. That it's this searching for perfection that's so problematic. Why is it so hard to accept that we're human and messy and imperfect? Our sages knew it, thus the Middle Eastern tradition of deliberately flawed carpets or the orthodox Jewish one of leaving unpainted patches of wall, remind us that only God is capable of perfection. In fact, judgment belongs to God alone, could as well be rendered as perfection belongs to God alone. Perfection is transcendent, beyond the human. The Quran notes that humans are the most contentious of all beings, which is absolutely undeniable, but perhaps we could be less so if we could not only abandon all hope of a perfect past, but also let go of the idea of a perfect future. That is, if more people were to adopt what I understand as a more Sufi way of seeing things, which is to strive for perfection in the full knowledge that it is unattainable, an impossible ideal, beyond the reach of human beings. As against the black and white digital way of being in the world, a world of absolutes, of either or, inside or outside, I would pose the recognition that between pure black and pure white, there are an infinite number of shades of gray, and that this is where we live. Or to put it another way, we live between the two poles, the North Pole and the South Pole, not at them, because human life at the North Pole and the South Pole is quite simply impossible. This, to me, is what religion is really about. Not aspiring to be God, but aspiring to be, like the prophet himself, more fully human. Thank you for listening.